I think we're on. On your toes, Fenneman. Do you know those people are sitting out there? I certainly do. Those happen to be our sponsors. Fine-looking lads, wouldn't you say, Fenneman? Oh, very fine-looking indeed. This boy's going places. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I can't be with you for your meeting today, but uh, I'm sort of busy right where I am. As a matter of fact, we just completed the first You Bet Your Life show for the fall radio and television season. As you know, our show is on film, and since many of you are not familiar with the procedure involved, I'd like to take you backstage and give you a rough idea of how we put this schnitzel together. Schnitzel meaning you bet your life. Before we go backstage, however, there's something I'd like to say, and I mean every word of it. Uh, where's that secretary? Uh, Miss Monroe, will you step off that counter and come in here, please? I want to dictate a personal letter to every dealer. Uh, take a letter to every DeSoto dealer in the country. Dear Sam. That's uh, S-A-M, Sam. I just had a preview of the 1953 DeSoto, and I wish I had the vocabulary to describe it. All I can say is that this is it. This one's got everything. The 1953 DeSoto is going to set all kinds of sales records. And I'm proud of the part I'll play in helping you make these sales records. They showed me an outline of the advertising program that's been prepared to help sell this great car to the public. And uh, it's intelligent, comprehensive, and, uh, well, if you'll pardon the expression coming from an old citizen of Hollywood, it's sensational. This campaign is sensational. I'm convinced, and I know you will be too, that your company has done everything to make 1953 your biggest year. Yours very truly, Groucho Marx. Now send that off right away, even if you have to put a stamp on it. And uh, I'll see you later. Scram, Marilyn. All right, man, come on backstage and we'll try to give you some idea of how we put this program together every week. Fight on Fenneman. Suppose you come in here and help me show the boys around. Uh, gladly, Groucho. Well, first, fellas, suppose that we show you the actual physical setup of our studio. She just left. <laughs> I meant of our studio, actually. Oh. Uh, then after we've shown you the physical setup of our studio, suppose that we take you back uh, behind the scenes, introduce you to a couple of the fellas that uh, you probably have never seen, but uh, who helped to make this the best program of its kind on the air. This is our studio, Studio D, NBC Hollywood. As you can see, the seats are inclined at rather a steep pitch, considerably more than in the ordinary movie theater, so that each one of the 350 people in our audience will have a full view of everything that happens on the show. And down there on the stage, you can see Groucho interviewing the contestants. Between Groucho and the audience are no fewer than eight movie cameras set in pairs at various angles. Four of them are constantly in action, while the other four are being reloaded to give a continuous film record of the show. Notice how the cameras, in picking up the best angles of the show, still are so located and so shielded as not to interfere with the studio audience's view of the proceedings on the stage. Not all television shows are able to maintain this close relationship between the performer and his audience. Here is Jerry Fielding leading the orchestra which provides music for the program. And here is a typical scene from the program. In fact, it was taken from the program which we filmed just tonight, the first one of the new season. I know I don't have to tell you fellows that there's no man on earth who can interview people like Groucho. Suppose we look in for just a moment, uh, sort of a preview. Say the secret word and divide $100. It's a common word, something you, you use every day. Louise Callahan and Harold Goodman. What, what sort of work do you do, my lad? I'm a physician. Oh, a doctor, eh? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm curious, what made you decide to become a doctor in the first place? Well, that's a question that I've been asked many times, and it's a very difficult one to answer. Was this after you operated they asked you that? <laughs> well, how do you answer that query? The answer of necessity has to be very nebulous and vague, and, and I just can't give you a specific Well, we don't object to a nebulous answer. You don't? Here. Oh, no. Well, it uh, offers a great You'd be surprised deal. how nebulous we can get on this show. <laughs> I've seen you before, and yes. I'm sure that... Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the field, of course... How would you like it if I practiced <laughs> medicine, huh? I'm, sorry. I'm allegedly the comic on this show. Uh, medicine offers a great deal of variety, and... Um, Yes, sir, Groucho really makes America laugh every week. Millions and millions of us. And behind the scenes every week are people helping us put on these programs. So, uh, Groucho, would you do the honors? 
First of all, this is my partner and producer of You Bet Your Life, John Goodell. John, say something. Say anything. I'd be glad to, Groucher. I have something very definitely to say to the dealers. It's about who looks and who listens to this show, mainly the quantity of our listeners. There's a rating service that, oh, there must be a dozen different rating services that tell you how many people are looking and listening to your radio and television show. Now, I have a couple notes here of how many have been listening to the Groucho Show and looking at it during this last year. Right at this moment, we're number one on any radio show in the whole nation. And there's about 200 radio shows listed. We're number one out of 200. All last season, we were in the top 10 shows, top 10 out of 200, and usually in the top five. Let me see that. See the notes. I need my notes, please. Maybe I better ask for more money, huh? In television, it's just about the same thing. Now, the remarkable thing about that is we got the same show on radio as we have on television, and yet we're number one, or in the top five or 10, in television, the same as we are in radio. And there's about 200 television shows, too. Number one out of 200, number three or four out of 200. That's really up there. It's really so remarkable that right here in Los Angeles, we were number one last week in both radio and television at the same time. It's so remarkable it was on the front page of the paper. Now, let's see what that means in number of people. The average audience of a radio show, of our particular radio show, with this rating means 10 million people. And in television, it means 18 million people. That means 28 million people a week on the average are that, looking or listening to this particular show. That's without my family. Yeah, but well, we don't count them because they don't have a phone. They can't contact them for the rating service. Uh, you couldn't count them anyhow. That means one out of six people in the United States are looking or listening to this show every week. What are the other five doing, John? And these aren't just passive people. These are people that are interested in Groucho. He gets through to them. He gets into their hearts. And then you add to that what we've got to sell a 1953 DeSoto and all its great advantages. You put those two things in combination and you've got something that no competitor can approach. Right, Groucho? Unqualifiedly. I hope you were listening. Now, there's, um, we'd like naturally to think that nobody else had anything to do with putting on this show. First, uh, but I'm afraid that it would, the noise would get to you sooner or later that there are some little help on this show. Perhaps you may have noticed at the end of the show those list of words of credits and so on. They're really not connected to the four or five spot announcements that follow the show. They are part of the show. And a couple of names on there are Bob Dwan and Bernie Smith, co-directors. A very integral part, an important part of putting on these shows every week. And I'd like to introduce one of the co-directors now Bernie Smith, and he can tell you what he does. Come on in, Bernie. Well, yeah. Bernie, there he is. <laughs> That's your name, huh? Bernie Smith, huh? Yes, sir. Where are you from, Bernie? I'm uh, from San Diego. Oh, well, it's California a nice place boy. to be from. Yes. Well, John, no, we I have a very good dealer, though. presume that uh, you would like to have me describe a little bit what I do on the show. I've often wondered. And, I'd like uh, to have you do yes. that. I will do forthwith uh, without... Uh, any interruptions, I hope. No, there'll be no interruptions. Uh, I may butt in occasionally. <laughs> briefly, uh, my job is to locate people who have something to say and who will say it when they get on the stage, despite the fact that uh, they have an opportunity to win a great amount of money. Uh, there are eight cameras staring at them, 350 people in the audience laughing at them, and Mr. Mark sitting on his stool doing his best to see that they enjoy themselves. So we have three sources uh, for our contestants. And here's a point, too, that I want to make that uh, may be of interest to you. We've had 1,200 people standing uh, where I'm standing now and facing Mr. Marks in the last six years. And uh, of those 1,200 people, we have duplicated op occupations and personalities only 10 times. And the rest of them have all been different personalities with different things to say, which I think is quite remarkable. Yes, and shows how many rackets there are in America. <laughs> um, we have three sources for our contestants. The most important is the studio audience, of course. Now, because of the vast amount of money that we disperse so willingly, uh, we attract the type of people that we're looking for. We can usually bank on finding several housewives in the audience uh, who have something to say, and maybe they met their wife while, or their husband while swimming the channel or something like that. Before the show starts, uh, George Fanneman goes out uh, on stage and asks for people in the audience to volunteer, people who have something to say and who have odd occupations. Groucho never sees them, has nothing to do with them until they eventually wind up here opposite him on the stool. That's true. And once the show is over, they have nothing to do with me. <laughs> uh, 
George sends them to the back of the house, and I have a crew that goes back with me, and we listen to the people, and we look them over for appearance and for uh, their glibness and imagination. And Get general, an occasional phone number? Well, what they have to say, and I have a little book. Uh, briefly, that's what I do. I consider it quite important, and it's been a wonderful uh, experience working with Mr. Marks. I have only one goal in life. The next time the jackpot gets to $6,000, I'm going to be a contestant. And uh, so that takes care of me. And I'm going to be your partner, Bernie. <laughs> that's right. That takes care of me. I'd like to introduce the man who directs the performance and who has a great deal to do with putting the show together afterward, the one, the only, Bob Vaughn. Where is he? Oh, Bob here he Ray. is. Thank He's you. laughing Bob. Eh? Yes. There they are, Bob and Ray. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I'd like to... Sessman. My oh. name isn't Smith. I, I want to explain a little bit about Don't how... you know who I am yet? Yes, I do. Oh. After six years, I am well acquainted. Uh, who am I? The one, the only, Groucho. That's right. Uh, What's yes. my line? <laughs> I would like to explain a little about how we... Uh, why and how we edit the show. I think you should. I think you owe it to these people. Yeah. Well, it may be a little surprising to, to realize that the technique that we've developed on this show really sprang from uh, one that was uh, started by the Army uh, with the idea of uh, eliminating commercials from uh, radio shows. Uh, this uh, technique of, of taking commercials out so they could be sent overseas, uh, we picked up and developed into a very successful commercial operation, but specifically for you, Groucho, and the type of show we wanted to put on. It, it uh, had two things in mind. It allowed us to bring up real people not actors. We, we always had a theory that uh, to bring up a, a real plumber, and uh, if you make a few insulting remarks about plumbers, it's twice as funny to have a real plumber there than an actor playing the part of a plumber. Yes. Especially uh, if there's a leak someplace around. Yeah. Uh, so this allows us to bring untrained people up there, let them say whatever they want, and also allows you to say the first thing that comes into your mind. Uh, actually, it isn't, I think, the first thing that comes into your no, mind. I'd say it's about the third. Yeah, I think from staying alongside of you for about six years that what actually happens is somebody says something and then you think of three things and usually reject all three of those and say something else which probably even you didn't know you were going to say in the first That's place. That's true. We, we edit the show for a lot of reasons, mainly uh, to take it down to its proper length, but also to choose the, the proper angles to, uh, to show you and depict the... Uh, because we have a camera photographing you constantly, we can get all of the 17 varieties of Lear that I have come to uh, That's know. Right. They don't call me King Lear for nothing. <laughs> There's about 14 different ways uh, that you hold the cigar uh, that all have uh, little subtle variations of meaning. And uh, we are always able to throw this in at the proper place. And also lines that uh, belong on you that you'd never anticipate that you were going to say. For instance, in the show I just finished cutting, uh, you threw in a line about uh, Fire Dome Fenneman in a, in a place that no one would ever uh, expect that it would come. And we, because we had the camera on you, we were able to give a close-up of you saying those uh, very important yes. words. We also edit the show sometimes because uh, we like to ask uh, as many leading questions of people as possible. They might say something funny, you can't tell. Sometimes they don't, that part we delete. And occasionally, very occasionally, somebody uh, says something... Um, that is slightly obscene. Uh, just slightly. As a matter of fact, uh, you saw earlier uh, the uh, in this film uh, one of our contestants, a, a young doctor. Well, uh, some of what the young doctor said uh, will not appear on that show. And um, maybe if we showed the film right now, it would give you an idea of, of uh, the kind of thing we occasionally uh, leave on the cutting room floor. Could you give us a sample of uh, excitement? Well, most of the things that happened would be unethical for me to relate here. But uh, uh, a very funny thing did happen while I was a second-year medical student, which Your I... Your ethics relate. are too high. <laughs> That's another way we don't usually mention here, ethics. <laughs> <laughs> There's hardly any ways you can mention here. <laughs> Forty million people are watching this show, Groucho. I have to watch myself. I see. Well, don't uh, be too optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us what happens. Well, uh, in my second year of medical school, um, we were seeing our patients for the very first time in the course in physical diagnosis. And um, I was assigned a patient, uh, went over her fairly thoroughly, um, put my stethoscope to her chest and uh, couldn't hear a heartbeat. And... Um, frantically moved from point to point, still didn't hear anything, and I was...
Would you mind repeating that in case? This was a male patient. Wait, which? What's that? We'll go back and make it a male patient. Let's have the story over again and keep it clean this time. Where do you want me to start? Well, now you met all the brain trusts who stand on back of me each week. My producer, John Goodell, and my two directors, Bob Dwan and Blaney Smith. Next, I'd like to present a person who isn't very familiar to you, and unfortunately, isn't very familiar with me either. Uh, Miss Monroe, would you mind coming in with your calendar again? I take a postscript of their letter to all the dealers. You got a friend for one of these dealers? Huh? <laughs> P.S., maybe you never realized it, but uh, the new 1953 DeSoto was going to set a record for automobile advertising. More people will hear about the 1953 DeSoto than any other automobile in history. Let me see this. That's what they told me. I'm convinced the advertising will do a great job. From what I hear, so will you dealers. And oh yes, don't forget little old me. And don't you forget little old me either. I'm a DeSoto salesman too, and I promise you I'll personally be doing everything I can to help sell the 1953 DeSoto at every opportunity. In our commercials? In our ads? I don't trust you. Okay. And of course, at that special place in every one of our programs on radio and television, which I'm told has been repeated thousands and thousands of times throughout the country. Friends, go in and see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer tomorrow. And when you do, tell them Groucho sent you. <laughs>